Hello and welcome to another D&D Stories. I'm your host, T the Writer, and this is the show where I sit here and regale you with all the tabletop gaming stories and remember when something cool happened. So, we return once more to Goddess Wheel, the desert-based campaign where our heroes have been running around trying to collect the pages of the Infinity Book. Not only to learn the story, the history of the past thousand years that has been lost to the sands of time, but to gain the ability to go and pick up a magic megaphone to talk to God. Now, if you recall, our heroes have been bullied over and over by the same massive sand dragon, and in their frustration, they went and bought a sand ship with a full crew, eight cannons, a harpoon gun, etc., 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 and they were decked out to, uh, to make this battle happen. The only thing they had to do was roll a one again, and you'd think on a scale of a hundred, that would take a while, or that would take just a... It just wouldn't happen after they actually bought the ship. But, as I said, Avaros has been using the world map to uh, plot this dragon's actual physical location for territory, since so long as they were steering the ship between all the X's, uh, I upped the chances for them to run into this guy. So they basically stopped going to dungeons after a while. They're like, we can't let him sneak up onto us. We have to go find him. And it's like, so Catherine gets up on the deck of the ship, like in front of, you know, get the men out here. We have to give them a pep talk. And she's, she, again, is barely garbed in anything. So, of course, they're willing to stare at her while she talks. And she's got the big captain's hat on. And the two... Uh, the, the wand of magic missile in one hand and a hand crossbow in the other hand. And he goes, men, you know what we're out here for. A massive sand dragon has been plaguing these lands, or what's left of these lands, for ages now. And none have been able to conquer him. But here we stand with eight cannons and a crew of men. And, and we four great and powerful heroes with, with thick armor and magic and etc, etc. And he goes, we are not here just to go from A to B. We are here to slay a mighty dragon. And let me tell you, boys, they've stolen. And she, she looks down at the paper because they've been robbed like seven times and the price keeps getting worse every time. He has stolen 91,000 gold pieces from us on top of whatever hoard he's already got. And it's all just attached to his underside like so much armor. And should we win the day... Should you be a man who is steering the ship, who is, who is shooting the cannons, who's got a long bow if you're not doing anything else with serrated arrows, if we take this dragon out, it's a thousand gold for every single one of you. And they're like, yeah, a thousand gold. Because, you know, you pay them like ten gold a week or whatever. The, the price is in, in Sandstorm. A thousand gold for every single one of you. And they're like, oh my god, a thousand gold. Yeah, this expedition rocks. And, and I, I asked them, I said, you know, if you kill the sand dragon, how are you going to carry his hoard anywhere? You know, the ship's not that big. And they go, we've got bags of holding. It's fine. And I look over, and sure enough, they've got like half a dozen bags of holding. This is what happens when you give players a lot of money. They, they have stuff that they can just pull out of their asses at any time. Yeah, we've got like six bags of holding. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so I was like, okay, you set everybody on the watch and you uh, steer straight into this sand dragon's territory, and Rockin is off to one side, kind of like leaning on the mast while uh, just kind of looking out at the endless sea of sand, and Catherine kind of sidles up next to him and goes, you know, are you going to be ready for this? And of course Rockin, huh, he's not going to be able to get through my armor, and holds up his hands where he's got two of the, uh, of, like, rings of protection, plus three or plus four, like, outrageously expensive rings. This, and again, I'm kind of tipping my hand to you about the sheer amount of money I've been giving them because I want them to go through all the magic items and pick all the cool stuff I want. I mean, I probably dropped way too much money and way too many magic items, but I wanted them to feel powerful, and I was throwing powerful stuff at them, so... Rakan went off, like, on top of his armor, on top of his indestructible shield and his great, you know, sword of, of bursting fire or whatever he bought. He went and got two rings of plus three and plus four protection. 
So his armor class went up even higher, and he's cresting like 30 or 40 at this point. He's like, you know, I'm, I'm, I've got extra, extra protection. This is going to be just fine. He can punch me in the head as many times as he wants. I'm not going to sink into the sand anymore. I've been learning how to plant my feet. And, and, and I think he took a feat for, like, a higher fortitude save. So, like, whenever he received, like, that fist to knock him into the sand, he would roll a fortitude, and he would always fail it. So he's like, I'm, I'm going to be covered better this time, Catherine. And uh, meanwhile, you know, I'm going to be standing in melee range while you guys are shooting cannons at him, so try not to blow me up. Ha, 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 ha. Uh, not that a cannon could get through my armor. He's, he's just, his ego is astounding. And Catherine's like, you know, we'll all be rooting for you, you know, because if, if he gets up onto the ship, it's not going to be good for us. And they stand there, like, watching the dunes go by for a long time. Because, again, this ship goes, like, 80 miles an hour. They could be across the map in... 10, 12 days maximum if they went from the east side to the west side. And uh, Catherine kind of nods for a while and she puts an arm around his hip. There's like a quiet romance going on when Avaros and uh, Gale aren't looking. And they stand there in the dark for a long time and dawn is upon them as they're entering the uh, Sand Dragon's territory like proper. And they go, well, he could be anywhere within this radius. And, and uh, Avaros has gotten up and he's got the big map. And he, he draws like a big oblong shape around all the X's and places where they've seen him before. And if you've got like six or seven X's on a map, you can kind of speculate where he's going to be at any given time. And uh, sure enough, after a while... As I keep, like, upping the chance, as long as they stay within this perimeter, I keep upping the chance that they're going to run into him. And sure enough, eventually they do. The sand dragon, like, bursts out of this uh, sandy and, and rock formation. And he's like, ah, foolish mortals, you've entered my territory. And he kind of pauses for a second because there's a fucking sand ship now with, with cannons and, and filigree all up and down at a great big sail with the symbol of the capital on it, and it's filled full of people, and he's like, you know, your money or your ship? And he, he like, puffs himself up big and throws his wings open. You can see the sun glinting on his scales and his teeth, or I'll sandblast your ship into oblivion. And there's this long silence, because the players know it's not going to get any better than this. Like... The ship, this is the biggest gun they could find. They've got, you know, the harpoon cannons, the regular cannons, the crew themselves. They've got, you know, Rakin's got all of his armor. Avaros can shadow jump at this point. You know, they've still got all the, the bows and arrows with serrated arrows in them. They've got all these different things. Like, if they don't beat him now, they're not going to beat him at all. Like, this is going to be to the death. Because if they blow up, if he blows up the sand ship, that's it. There's going to be like 30 or 40 really angry dudes following them across the desert. And all their supplies are going to be gone. So this is like the last time they run into this reoccurring character. And if they don't do it, it's not going to get done. And so I go, you know, the, the crew is looking to you for orders, Catherine. What do you do? And uh, they, they draw the ship like broadside to, to face this dragon. And, you know, none of the cannon flaps are open. They're just kind of, like, cruising along very slowly. And the dragon shouts again, Your money or your ship and everyone on it! I grow impatient with you! And Rockin like, jumps up onto the railing, and he's like, You won't get through my armor! And jumps down onto the sand and starts running at him. Ah! And Avaros jumps off of the port, and <laughs> freaking Gale jumps off to, and then just the three of them, and it's like, there's only three, where's, where's the fourth one? He doesn't know, but Catherine looks over at the helmsman, and she goes, raise the colors, and they go, raise the colors, raise the colors, so they start pulling ropes, and they extend all the sails, and the ship lurches forward, to its full speed, magic and wind and everything else that's making this thing go. And the ship just <laughs> goes straight across the sand, throwing like a V formation of sand out behind itself. 
Ready the cannons, ready the harpoon cannon. Take no prisoners. And all eight of the cannons like lurch forward out of these little portals that uh, flip up with wood to keep them hidden. And they go, ready, we want a full volley right before they end up in front of the sand dragon at melee range. Aim and fire. <laughs> all the cannon shot goes all at the same time. And this dragon gets peppered straight into his side with cannonballs. And they go, draw straight forward. We're going to put the freaking harpoon gun right into his neck. Go, go, go. And so they run broadside alongside this dragon and fill his sides full of cannon shot and cannonballs. And then they face the ship straight forward. And the and it's like, it's again, it's something out of Skies of Arcadia. Harpoon cannon, fire! And they launch this harpoon cannon. It goes straight through one of his wing ligaments. And of course, the little claw thing opens. Chink! And they pull the chain tight so they can keep him from like getting away. Because we've seen that he can swim through sand. It's like, he's not going to get away this time. And the dragon is completely thrown off guard because cannons hurt, no matter how big you are. And right then, Rock Hen gets right into his face with a big, like, plus one mace. Ah! Oh, Knocks him over the muzzle. The ship and the dragon are chained together. So the circle, the, the ship is just kind of circling him while Rock Hen's, like, in there trying to beat him over the face. And, of course, dragons cast huge shadows. So Alvaros is able to, like, teleport every which way because the, the ship is casting a huge shadow. The dragon is casting a huge shadow, as are his friends, because it's getting into, like, the, the morning where the sun casts long shadows before midday. So he's, like, teleporting every which way, just, just stabby, 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 just trying to get into him. And the dragon flaps his wings and sends the sand-blasting breath every which way. And it's like, oh, I'm here to fucking kill you this time, dragon. Ah. And it's it comes to a point where there's like there's so many things hitting this dragon. It doesn't really matter what his stats are anymore. Because we've got eight cannons, plus four heroes, plus whoever's up there on the boat shooting serrated arrows. It's like they basically overnumbered him this time. And he turns because he's bleeding at this point. He's he's like below half of his health. He turns to leave, and it lurches with the ship because he's got a chain and a harpoon in his wing ligaments. He's not going anywhere without losing a wing. They're like, turn the cranks! Turn the cranks! Pull him out of the sand! And, you know, Catherine's up. She climbs the ladder up onto the crow's nest. You know, magic missile! Magic missile! You know, trying to do what she can while she's coordinating the whole damn ship. Meanwhile, there's crewmen on both sides of the ship shooting freaking serrated arrows, throwing alchemist fires. Like, this is basically a raid fight at this point. There's so much shit flying at this dragon. It's hard to miss. <laughs> but finally, finally they get up to this thing, and they're like, okay, we're gonna ram him. I want to see that thing's belly ram straight into him. Ramming speed! And they... They pull the chain in. They're, like, turning the crank to, like, reel him in like a fish. And they ram the ship into this thing's side. And finally, Avaros is like, I pull out, fuck dragons. I jump up onto the ship. Then I jump over the ship onto the dragon's face. And I put the crossbow bolt right in his eyeball. Fuck dragons. And shoots this giant crossbow bolt from this outrageous weapon that he made from the dragon's eyeball straight through his brain and out through his other eyeball and the dragon dies and goes limp. Yeah! Fuck dragons! And Avaros like jumps off and starts like kicking it to make sure it's dead. Fuck dragons! Fuck dragons! <laughs> so finally, finally everything goes quiet. And this dragon's laying on its side. It's full of cannon holes. It's got arrows sticking out of it. It's still got the the freaking harpoon gun uh, javelin thing sticking out of its side. It's covered with, with, you know, alchemist fire oil. You know, it's just a completely destroyed corpse. Like, they actually got him pretty good this time. And after all the times that he bullied them, this was like their biggest shining moment. that They finally got this fucker. <laughs> 
And so, you know, you know, three cheers for the crew. Ah, three cheers for the heroes. Yeah. <laughs> three cheers for Catherine. Yeah. <laughs> So, so they erupt into cheers, and as soon as the dragon dies, of course, the, the horde comes spilling off of its body from its, from its belly and its chest. And they go, oh my gosh, what kind of horde is this? We know it's, he's at least got our stuff. I can't imagine what all kinds of stuff he's got other than ours. And I go, yeah, sure enough. And I lean over and I pull out like a, like a scroll, like a printout. And I was like... You find, you know, your 91,000 gold that he stole from you. Yes. You know, th you know 30, 40,000 of that goes to the crew. But, you know, you also find, and then I hand them the big giant sheet of paper. And if you know me, you know I love designing dragon hordes because that's gold, gems, weapons, armor, furniture, artwork, statues, everything in between, jewelry, books, you know entire like an entire ecosystem of stuff was attached to this thing's underbelly that that you know I like I said he's basically a treasure whale and they finally got him and they're like yes we're just gonna start mounding that gold mound all those gems in there you know we're gonna bring the crew down to to grab like that wardrobe that was attached to his bottom you know grab that statue of a naked woman grab that cherub with diamonds for eyes you know that that portrait of an ancient king over there. Make sure that ends up in the captain's room. Yeah. <laughs> they spend all day picking this guy clean, and that's not even accounting for the dragon's body. Uh, just getting the horde onto the ship. They've got barrels of freaking gold pieces for the crew. Just barrels of it. And they've got all these exotic items. They find magic weapons. They find, you know, the, the cloak of freaking bear strength. They got boots of expeditious retreat they find all kinds of stuff i think i made like a 60 item list and the first couple were like gold gems and 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 money and then all the rest was like unique stuff that i had just like picked out for them you will never see your players happier than if you properly design a dragon's horde because money and gems are going to be the least interesting thing they should find but it'll still make them happy. So the other 58 things, uh, they I think we, we decided to call it there because they spent so much time, oh, what are we going to do with this? Oh, we could decorate the ship with that. It's like we basically just like called the game there because they were so happy and they had so much stuff and we needed to decide what to do with it. You know, one of the crew members wants this. Yeah, sure. You know, here's an enchanted boomerang that always comes back regardless of the weather circumstances. Okay, yeah. You know, here's here's some uh, some forever chain. It never breaks and stuff like this. They, they it was just all kinds of freaking stuff from the sand dragon. It's like you finally find a big uh, a big chest that's full of spell scrolls, and of course you find one of the pages of the Infinity Book in there. So Catherine is loaded down with spell scrolls, and they get the uh, the Infinity page, and they're like, yes, okay. You know, park the ship here. We're having a party. <laughs> so, so they pull out. They basically take the kitchen out of the ship and put it on the sand, and they they're gonna host like a big barbecue. <laughs> so they're cutting off slices of the dragon's tail. They're they're you know, does anybody here have fletching? Oh, you do. Okay, start ripping scales off and stuff like that. We'll pay you an extra five hundred gold, whatever it happens to be. So they got both the horns. They got all the claws, you know, properly this time, not just scraping it off like lunatics. They got both the horns, they got all the teeth, they got all the claws, they got a shit ton of scales. You know, this was a big kill for them, so they were aptly rewarded. So, uh, they party well into the night. There are dragon burgers and dragon steaks for like all 30 or 40 crew members here along with whatever ale and wine they've got, plus the four adventures. You know, there's people dancing on tables. They're throwing huge parties. I think Catherine and uh, Rockhand snuck off for, <laughs> for a little personal time. You know, this was a monstrous victory for them. And by the time, you know, they, they stayed there for like, I think, two or three days, like harvesting and making sure they've packed up all the hoard and all the uh, extra items that were in it. And they're like, well, we could, you know, we could sell this, we can keep this, we can decorate the ship with this. You know, I basically had to, like I said, end the session there and give them like the week 
before the next game to decide what they were going to do with all this stuff because there was a ton of it. You know, given this dragon's size and age and, and species, he was probably, like, up there as far as uh, uh, powerful dragons were. And he had just been alive so long and robbed so many people just out in the desert that couldn't defend themselves that his horde was, you know, two, three times the size of normal. So they, they decide that they're going to deck out the ship even further. They give everybody, they promised their, their thousand gold plus a pick of something from the horde and et cetera, et cetera. They are living it up like kings at this point. But the most important bit that they did get was the Infinity Book page, and they were ready to move on from there. So um, by this point, you know, they, they go to one or two more dungeons. And again, not especially important story-wise, just they go there, they fight whatever's in there, they get the page, and they, they continue on. But um, by and large, they do end up with all nine pages. And they go, okay... We've, uh, we've, we go back to the curator. Oh, how you doing there, Yugi boy? I see you've got the ninth page. Wonderful. Now that I have enough to decipher all this ancient language and be able to read all the things in the margins and decipher all the hieroglyphs that you can only see if you hold it up to the light, I'll be able to get the full and complete story. Good job. You know, come back in a few days and I'll be able to tell you everything. And they're like, yeah, we go out to the nearest tavern, and we party, and we, we find, you know, steaks and whores and wine, and we live it up, because, you know, they're basically the richest guys in the whole damn capital, if not the world at this point, because they pulled in a dragon's horde. You know, they put it, they straight away put it all in the bank so they wouldn't get robbed, but, you know, they, they bought, like, a three-story mansion, and they filled it with servants, and they, they, they all decide to live together because, you know, their adventure has come to an end, and they've gotten all this money, all this treasure. You know, they, they park the heart of gold, but they keep paying the crew in case they need to go out there, and they restock it, and they, they get, like, extra good food for when they have to go out again because they're, they're still playing, so there's still something to do. And they go, okay. You know, what do we do now? We've got all nine of the pages, and we're just kind of waiting on this. So they go back in uh, three pages, you know, or in three days, rather, and they go, you know, Curator, have you discovered everything that you wanted? You know, are we going to be able to talk with the goddess, or, or god, you know, out of the goddess wheel now? And he goes, well, here you are, Yugi boy. You know, here's the nine hints of the goddess wheel. If you can decipher them, I can certainly imagine that you can talk to god, I, however, have found everything that I wanted, so this, this ability to talk to a higher deity will be your vast reward. And they go, wow, really? He didn't just take off across the desert to try and, uh, try and do this himself. And it's like, well, he's an archaeologist. He's a curator. He wanted to know what happened. Now he does know. You know, knowledge is a form of treasure to, to people like him. And, you know, anyone would jump at the chance to talk to God, but getting across the desert is probably not something he's especially capable of. And he goes, and they go, oh, right, yeah, okay. And he go, they go, well, now that they've seen the whole story, they go, well, curator, how, who wrote the Infinity Book? Who was there for all these events? Because, you know, a bunch of these battles and deaths and stuff took place out in the middle of the desert, and, you know, they didn't have followers with them all the time, or they didn't, you know, somebody would have had to have borne witness to, to these demigods killing each other and, and seeing all these events in the past. What happened? You know, who's, who is the author of the Infinity Book? And, and the curator looks over and he goes, Well, Yugi boy... The author of the Infinity Book is none other than Drode of the Shifting Time. And they go, oh yeah, that kind of makes sense. You know, he's the one that survived, so he was probably the one that put all this information together. So Drode of the Shifting Time wrote the Infinity Book. Whatever happened to him? And he goes, we shall never know, Yugi boy. He was apparently just as mortal as any other mortal out there just descended from a higher, more powerful being. I mean, if you're not completely a god, then you'll never, you know, you're not going to live forever. Even elves, 
die out eventually. And then they go, yeah, that's true. If he was like half God or half human, and, and again, the Infinity Book got a lot of stuff wrong in terms of like divinity and who's a god and who's not, but that's neither here nor there. They go, well, yeah, Drode wasn't a god, but yeah, it's been a thousand years or 1,200 years. He probably just died of old age. You know, if he, if he ruled the world for a couple of hundred years and then got sick and died or got murdered or whatever it happened to be, you know, he can't record his own death and, you know, everything else has been lost uh, over the ages, so we may never know the whole story. And he goes, yes, that's true, Yugi boy. Now, now that I've gained everything that I need, I'm willing to uh, jump to the next plane of existence. And they go, what? And he goes, yes, now that I know what has happened to this world, I am able to move on without having to worry, you know. And he, he uh, goes on to, like, the next section of the, uh, of the museum, and he goes, I'm sad to leave all of these things behind, but history speaks louder than any of the knickknacks and weapons and spears and different things mounted on these walls. And he goes, we lost the way to, to jump dimensions a long time ago. There are no wizards or sorcerers left that can do such a thing. And he goes, yes, but... Once you have talked, gone to the goddess wheel and talked with God, or what have you, the mother goddess, you can ask her to bring such magic back, or you can ask her to remake the world, whatever you like. You know, plead for our existence. We have to move on. We have to either get off this shrinking island, or you need to wish for the world to be, reward, to be reborn or something. You must do something now that you have unlocked the secret of the goddess wheel. You know, we cannot stay here. The world is shrinking. And they go, yeah, he's right. And they go, okay, so we have one more, one more trip ahead of us. We have to go out to the goddess wheel. And they go, okay. You know, we, we make the proper, you know, we make the proper uh, preparations, we ready the crew, you know, they did a bunch of shopping, because, you know, there's going to be a boss battle somewhere. Um, you know, we've got all the notes and hints and riddles and stuff, and they sit there and they confer over it for a while. They've got all nine of the hints, and no, I don't remember what they are, but uh, there's like, well, it's you got to enter the labyrinth from the south, and you've, you know, the, the three numbers of the room make 14, so we know it's not the first 99 rooms, and, you know, you can only go through five rooms before you reach your destination, and, you know, blah, 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 and they, they reel down all these things, and they've, they've got, like, a map. You know, the goddess wheel is hundreds of years old, so people have gone through and mapped it relatively thoroughly now. That's why there's no monsters there. Um, enough explorers just go in there out of curiosity, and the curator, of course, has an up-to-date map, of the goddess wheel, and all the rooms are numbered as they are in real life, and they go, okay, so it's, and then they, they go, okay, southern entrance, five rooms, and then they go through all the hints, and they're like, okay, they've, we narrowed it down to five rooms, then we narrowed it down to two rooms, it's this room, and they're like, okay, we just have to go to the goddess wheel, and get five rooms in, and then we can talk to God, and they're like, okay, let's do it. So, they make their preparations, and they hop on the sand ship, and they go, Curator, you know, we're about to remake the world or, or leave it. Do you want to come with us? And he goes, well, Yugi boy, I think I will. So he puts on his Indiana Jones hat, and he gets into some desert garb and goes, you know, we're going on an adventure. Woo! <laughs> and they set out across the desert. Now, again, the sand ship goes like 80 miles an hour, so it only takes a couple of days to get there. And uh, interacting with the curator is kind of weird, because, again, he's Maximilian Pegasus, just... Anyway, but he's got the, the complete edition of the Infinity Book, and is going over it over and over again, uh, trying to see if they missed any details, if there's any hieroglyphs that you like to have to hold up and see it by moonlight or whatever it happens to be, but they don't find anything new or different. So they arrive at the Goddess Wheel, a, a completely deserted sort of place that, again, it's like a big stone coin laying on the ground. 
that's 900 rooms. It's got a lot of entrances and a lot of exits, and it's just this this puzzling nonsense full of full of rooms and rooms and rooms, all of which are numbered, strangely enough, but uh, only one of which is important. And they're like, okay, dungeon mode, you guys. You know, Rakin goes first and Avaris, Avaros goes last. And so they, they shoulder up their gear and they've got the uh, curator following them. Uh, not last in case they get... Uh, jumped or something, but not in front either. And they go, okay, you know, according to the map, we've got to go from here to here, from here to here, and from here to here. And they, they go in through these five rooms. They go, do we find any, like, traps or treasure chests or monsters or anything? And I go, no. It's a it's like going through a, a beehive, but none of the bees are home. You know, there's doors, there's uh, porticalises that you can lift easily. There's chains you can yank on that don't do anything. The stonework is ancient. The only thing that's different in every room is that in the center of every room is is like carved into the stone in filigree is the number for the room. And they like check their map and they go to the next room and they check their map and they go to the next room. It's like yeah, this map is accurate. You know, there's no funny stuff going on here. And they go well, what ritual do we have to? Uh, have to do in order to activate this place. It's like five rooms in. That'll take us five minutes to get there. Maybe. So they jump off the ship and they're they're going in. And, you know, they make it to the proper room. And it's like, okay, according to all the hints, you know, does this meet all the hints? It's like, it's five rooms in. We, we came in from the south. All the digits of the room make the number 14. You know, and they, they go through the nine hints. We're like, yeah, this is this is the only room that fits that. This is the right room. And the cur they look at the curator and they go, okay, curator, how do we use the goddess wheel? It's, this is it. You know, it's, it's just an empty stone room. And he takes the infinity book and he puts it down over the number. And all the doors close. And they go, oh, this is it. This is it, isn't it? And just then, after all the doors close, the entire room folds away. Like when you when you make a cube out of paper and then you unfold the whole thing, the whole room unfolds away and they find themselves in a white abyss. It's like this is a different dimension that they've come to and they've used the infinity book to get here. And they go, well, Yugi boy, this looks like this is it. And they look around for a while. It's just a white void in all directions. It's, it's like the hyperbolic time chamber. You can see like a horizon and there's some sort of sun in the sky, but it's clean, it's perfect. Other than the stones that they're standing on, they have no point of reference for anything other than, like, the horizon. And they go, what do, what do we do now? And descending from the sky comes uh, something horrifying, something they were not expecting, a guardian if you will. You want to talk to God, you have to get past the operator, basically. And descending from the sky is a massive, massive beholder. Like, you remember back in the day when they made, like, the big purple uh, figs that were, like, three by threes or four by fours? They were, like, mega super necromancer beholders or whatever. It was basically that. It was purple dripping madness of, of just like jaws and eyes and has the the nine stalks with the nine eyeballs and each eyeball represents a different spell that can probably kill you if you don't freaking make your save and stuff like that. And they go, you will not reach the goddess. And he, he like comes down and like, he's like, boss battle. Dun, 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 <laughs> And the curator's like, oh, my God, and runs off to one side to be, like, out of range of this madness because, you know, he's a curator. He's got no business doing this. So the final boss battle of this campaign turns up to a massive beholder. And he's, again, he's got unravel. He's got turn to stone. He's got all the spells. And, and I, I usually hesitate quite a bit to use beholders because things that can just insta kill you don't seem fair to me but they're really powerful and they've got all the magic items they would ever need and it's four on one so there's eye beams going in all directions while while Avaros and Rakin run straight into melee with this thing 
And of course, Rakan's got the uh, the indestructible shield, so the uh, the eyeball beams just kind of bounce off it and, and don't affect it in any way because you can't burn it, you can't unravel it, you can't turn it to stone. It's basically immune to everything, even even the beholder uh, the beholder beams. So that magic item actually got a lot more use than I thought it would, just being indestructible. Um, so Rakin runs in there with the shield bash, and they start trying to like slice off eyeballs. It's flying around, taking chunks out of their shoulders with its massive jaws. It's throwing out the the fearful aura from its main eye. So they run around like mad for a while, trying to find cover. They're shooting at it. It's it's a boss battle. But in all eventuality, they do manage to take this thing down, like just barely. Like I think. I think Avaros and Gale and Catherine all got hit with uh, the the unravel beam. You know, it basically takes your body apart or your armor or whatever. So they're standing there like half naked and with like deep gouges up and down their arms because it was stripping away the flesh from their bones. So they're throwing potions on themselves as fast as they can so it doesn't like strip the flesh from their bones. Uh, doing this this beam over and over, and I did it completely fair. I did uh, since beholders usually have I think it's eight uh, eight uh, eye beams. I had a D eight and was throwing it, so it could have just as easily been the turn to stone ray. It could have just as easily been the death ray, but he kept he kept rolling the unravel. Uh, Ray, so he kept like unraveling their flesh from their bones. It was really nasty, but they did kill him, and um, it goes silent for a while. God, my nose itches, but um, and it it just kind of falls to one side. Master, you have guests, and falls to one side, and of course the gore and the blood go every which way. And they, they go over, they make sure it's dead. They've learned to make sure that things are dead after, after a few nasty scares. And I go, you've, you've slain the, uh, the guardian or the operator or whatever you would like to call him of the goddess wheel. You are now free to move forward to talk with uh, God or the goddess or whatever you like. And it's like, we go and we find the curator again. It's like, where is he? It's like, he's standing on a, an ivory or not ivory, God, a marble dais. Just a great big platform with like three steps on it. And it's knelt down in front of a great shining being. And they go, is, is that the goddess? The goddess of the goddess wheel? And they go, you'll have to go find out. So standing there, atop the, uh, atop the dais, there's more stairs that go up to like a small throne, basically. And uh, sitting on a massive chair in, amongst all the cushions is Natishka. Now, if you remember, Natishka was a, was a tiefling, basically. The, the result, half-demon baby, pink skin, red hair, yellow eyes. She looked very otherworldly. And she's sitting there, you know, buck naked, being, you know, swayed at with palm leaves by, by lesser mortals, like bronze-skinned men. She's, she's enjoying the, the power that has come with pretty much godhood. Um, she became so powerful, she rose to a higher, like, claim of existence. So she's not a god, but she's really close. So she can hop dimensions, she can change things all around her. her. Her heritage was so potent and outrageous and all of her adventures made her into something more than she was born as. So she's sitting there kind of leaned over with her, with her chin propped against her fist. You know, why have you come? You know, what, you know, who are these, who are these mortals to come and talk to me? I am Natishka, the goddess of the goddess wheel. And they go, this is her, this is her. And I show them, I show them the picture. And um, they go, you know, goddess, uh, we, the world is coming to an end. You have to save us. You know, the island is shrinking. There's only one tectonic plate of, of you know, whatever world there used to be. There's one forest 
in existence anymore. The, the silithid and the world eaters are eating out the, the world underneath us. We're going to fall into the abyss someday. You, you must remake the world. You must send everybody to another safer place. You must do something. And Natishka kind of looks down at them and goes, It has been many, many years since I have seen any of my children. I loosed them upon the world 1,100, 1,200 years ago, and now only one remains. And she slowly, like, rises off of her throne and, like, walks barefoot down these, these steep uh, white stairs. And she kneels down and slowly wraps her arms around the curator. And they go, is the curator drode? And I go, yes. <laughs> and he goes, if he didn't, if he knew everything, why did we go get the pages? And he goes, he may not have remembered. Something must have happened to him that he lost his memory. He lost the memory of his heritage. And all this has been so that he could call, call his mother down to help him and to help the world. And they go, oh my God. The curator was Drode, the last of the remaining or the last of the nine children. So she wraps her arms around him and pulls, you know, pulls his head to uh, rest on her shoulder and he goes, I am so happy to see you again, Drode. And, you know, Drode of the Shifting Time is, of course, weeping openly that, you know, he's found his memories, he's found the Infinity Book, he unlocked the Goddess Wheel, he's found his mother. Who is, who is hanging out in the space between spaces when she's not having these massive adventures of God knows what elsewhere. And he goes, Mother, you must help us. This, this world is not long for, before it just drops into nothing. And she goes, Very well, my son. I gave you a condition long ago that only one of you could rule this world, and if there were no world... Well, that wouldn't be fair to you, would it? And she strokes his hair for a long time, and, and the players are just kind of standing back. This is like a goddess and a demigod have been reunited, so it blows their minds. She goes, very well. I will replace all of the sands of the desert with seeds. And we go, like, every grain of sand is going to be a seed from now on? And they go, yes. And I will replace the earth beneath and I will get rid of the world eaters beneath as well. Your world will be reborn in my image and in my son's. And he goes, Mother, thank you. You have no idea how much this means to me and to everyone who's left. And she goes, I know. Now go forth and enjoy the new world as it is born before you. And she like gives a little like Jedi gesture of her hand and she sends everybody back to the entrance of the goddess wheel just in time for all of us to see all the desert sands turn to earth with a little layer over them that's all seeds and it starts growing grass and trees start shooting up out of the ground and you know the the edges of the mountains flatten themselves out and we can see you know greater and greater lands just forming up out of nothing that you see Silithids shooting out of the ground like machine guns as they get cast into the sky into oblivion. And the world, the whole damn planet, while they're watching, gets reborn around them. And suddenly they're standing in a deep forest with birds chirping and, and uh, wild cats wandering by just like looking at them. And, you know, quail running by in little rows. She basically hit a big reset button to uh, start the world anew right on the brink. She just, her attention just needed to be brought back to it. Like she'd become so powerful and so otherworldly that uh, her son had to come and ask her to, to make this happen. And the curator is sitting there just like sitting cross-legged, just looking around. You know, this is still drode of the shifting time, but this is a brand new world. For, for anybody. He could rule it. He could vanish into obscurity. He could just go keep being the curator. But 
you know, the populations of all the remaining races are going to explode. There's going to be new monsters, new animals. The Silithid and the World Eaters are gone, so they don't have to worry about that. You know, it's a planet again. It's it's all been restored to, to greenery and life, and there's going to be new kingdoms, new castles, new everything, because, you know, we have restored what we once lost. So the Wanti are gone from this world. The Ouroboros is no longer in the world. The Tarisk is gone. There are no greater evils left to uh, threaten all of existence, at least no local ones. So this like grand super campaign uh, came to a halt as our, or came to an end, as our adventurers watched the new planet being born around them, and Drode of the Shifting Time stands up and, and you know, throws his arms around them and is like, this, this is a new beginning for all of us. And that is where that campaign came to an end. Goddess Wheel, I think part of it was trying to pick up the pieces from what Rob did, but... Um, it had all new players. It, it reset the setting, uh, taking a few factors out. Like I said, the 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 Wanti and the Ouroboros and the Terrasque and all that. So there were no like world-ending events that were going to come to this setting ever again. So we kind of wrapped it up with a nice, neat bow. It's it's a whole new world to to explore and enjoy, and all the resources got got reset. And, and all the, the forests and the animals and everything in between, the elves are going to be thrilled when they see that the whole desert is like a forest and, and temperate now. And the mountains have rearranged themselves. And anyway, talking in circles. But it was a pretty good, like, rabbit with a bow ending. And they, they had to get back onto the heart of gold. And they realized, oh, we can't really take it anywhere. It's not a desert anymore. So they, uh, they get their... 30 or 40 crew members to gather up what they can carry and start heading back to the capital because no doubt everybody's noticed the desert is gone and everybody is thrilled. So they can see rivers, there's waterfalls, there's lakes, several acre wide lakes and tributaries and all these different things. They, they witnessed like the rebirth of this planet, the rebirth of paradise. So, Goddess Wheel, you know, what does Drode do? You know, does he try to take over the world because it's his divine right? I don't know. Does Natishka ever come back to uh, the setting? Probably not. She, there's other stories that have Natishka in them, but we'll get to that another time. And, I don't know. Goddess Wheel, to me, I think was a great way to wrap up like this this super campaign, this this super story, if you will. And when we come back, we'll come to a different campaign. We'll come to a different like storyline, if you will. But uh, this particular chapter has come to an end. So, I hope you enjoyed that story, and I hope you enjoyed, uh, you know, from episode one up until now was all one big thing. We'll try not to do that. Uh, as much anymore, but I hope you had fun because I know I did, and I'll see you guys on the next D and D stories. Keep gaming. Hey guys, thanks for watching. Be sure to hit that like button for me. If you want to keep up with channel updates, check me out on Facebook, and if you're feeling especially generous, be sure to visit my Patreon. Keep gaming.